Thank you. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen and apologies for not being there in person. I was very much looking forward to it, but unfortunately can't be here. So thank you particularly to the organizers for putting together such an interesting program and to Jen for chairing this session. And what I want to do today is to think about the limits of English colonial government, so really pushing political culture to its absolute limits in Ireland at the height of the pre-16th century lordship of Ireland, and to think about the distance between the English administration's attempted projection of power and the experiences of those who lived under that English government, both English and Irish in it, for this paper, we could also talk about the Flemings, the French, the Italians, and many more who can be found in medieval Ireland. And I want to use the records of the Irish Exchequer that I'm editing with Dr. Lynn Kogallan, as Jen said, as part of the Beyond 2022 project at Trinity College Dublin. So let's get started. Um, the first, first slide, but if this will stay put, apologies. This is Ireland circa 1300, at the absolute height of English control of Ireland in the medieval lordship. As you can see from this map, the settler lordship of Ireland circa 1300 claimed control over most of the Ireland from an administrative base in Dublin, but with significant Irish lordships present in Leinster, just to the south of Dublin, that's the McMurra on the map, in the west and particularly in the north, that absolute conglomeration of smaller um, Irish lordships to the north. And today what I really want to think about, taking my title as the margins, is the western coast, particularly Connacht, that old Gaelic province of Ireland, which has not yet been divided into English shires, although the English government does treat it as a shire in this period. Beaumont, um, which is hotly contested between Irish and English lords in the area, and Kerry, where and the just to the south there. And all of these areas are inevitably much more distant than the areas around Dublin, the areas that would become the pale in the 14th and 15th century. So circa 1300, if the English administration based in Dublin can and does treat the entire island as part of the English lordship with results that we will see momentarily. But it is inevitably much more messy than this because despite what the English administration in Dublin wants to think, there is significant resistance to it. So let's first think about the institution that I'm concerned with today and the records that it produced. This is the Irish Exchequer at work from a facsimile of the now destroyed Red Book of the Exchequer. And like the English Exchequer, the Irish Exchequer has responsibility for the finances of its territory, in its case, the, the Lordship of Ireland. And like the English Exchequer, it's divided into two parts. The Upper Exchequer, responsible for audit and, act, and acting as a court, and the Lower Exchequer, which takes in and pays out money. So what you can see on the screen is that process of audit. At the very bottom of the screen, you can see the sheriff here, um, sitting anxiously waiting to know if his accounts have been accepted, while around the other sides, the clerks count the money, write the records, and check the accounts. And so this is, you know, a fairly standard English administrative practice that has been imported wholesale by 1200 to Ireland and by 1300 is a well established part of the bureaucracy of English power in Ireland. But it's more complicated than that, because the, as many of you may know, the records of the Irish um, public the Irish public records were destroyed in 1922 uh, in the Four Courts fire at that year at the start of the Irish Civil War. So all of the medieval roles that had survived to the 19th century were destroyed then. But because of a series of accounting scandals in the 1270s to the 1290s, in 1293, the English King Edward I orders that all the accounts of the Irish treasurers should be audited at Westminster. And from the 1290s to 1446, every few years, the Irish treasurers cross the sea, carrying the records with them to be checked and audited at Westminster. And some of those records are then kept so they can be checked again at Westminster and enter the records of the English state and thus come down to the National Archives at Kew, where they remain today, a body of about 400 rolls. So it's a really substantial 
surviving collection of material, and it's those that Lynn and I are editing. These contemporaneous accounts, written in Dublin for the use of the Dublin Exchequer, brought to London to be audited at Westminster and then deposited into the records of the English state. And this replicates what we see across Ireland in this period, where the in theory, the institutions of Irish government, the Justicia, the Chancery, the Common Law Courts, the Exchequer are modelled on English models, but self-contained, are in theory self-sufficient for the Lordship, but in actuality can always be appealed to London, and that there's this really uneasy tension between how you move between these institutions of the settler government in Ireland and then the government at Westminster. So what do we find in the seat trolls? Well, we can, and how do they tell us about political culture? Well, the routine business of the Exchequer is um, payments to and from for things like judicial fines, the payments for, you know, making a false claim in court, for falsely prosecuting someone, for making you know, before not turning up when you're summoned to court, all of the kinds of things that are the intersection of English power with very local society. But what's really in interesting from, for our purposes today, thinking about the margins and how far English government reaches, is that for the receipt rolls, the money coming in, they are listed by day and by place. So once we have the full corpus next summer, we should be able to do some really interesting things about seeing where exactly English um, administration is able to get payments that it expects. And impressionistically, I can start to share some of the things that we've been seeing. First, thing that I've noticed is that it really does vary by urbanization. So if you think back to that map I showed at the start, just south of Kerry on the southwest coast is Cork. Cork has a major mercantile center and we see far more payments coming in from Cork than we do from Connacht or Kerry. Uh, the weight is just absolutely incomparably different. So are we seeing an English government which is exerting its power through urban centres and not so much in rural areas, or what else are we looking at? So let's look now at Kerry, so in the southwest corner just north of Cork. And on the face of it, you would expect to see very little from Kerry. It's far from English power, there are very strong local lords who are able to exert to competing influence, yet we get payments like this one at the top of the screen here from TNA E101 1. Where the second of those entries it says the wreck of the sea from Overith. Now, the wreck of the sea is a payment that English Queens struggle to collect anywhere, including in England, because it's the expectation that anything that's washed up on shore belongs to the king and isn't finders keepers. So to have a payment for wreck of the sea coming in from Kerry in the 1290s is pretty extraordinary. So for some reason, maybe a particularly effective local official, we get a payment that we barely see in Dublin coming out of the far southwest. So immediately jumping to assumptions that the English aren't going to be able to get payments they think they're due out of far areas needs to be questioned. But then we also get this interesting pattern that's the second item on your screen, TNA 101 to 3016, um, where you get these really strong clusters and it's there in the 1280s, it's there in the 1290s, and we'll see if it carries through well into the um, early 14th century before the collapse of English power in 1315, where you get, instead of being scattered through a roll, you'll get one or two sort of clusters of, in this case, 19 payments that all come in together. Um, and I think what we might be seeing here is one local official being particularly on the ball and particularly um, enforcing the um, demands of the English Exchequer, because what we have here is payments from the sheriff, William Uncle, for the debts and the profit of the country. So the standard payments the sheriffs are expected to collect. We have um, payments for trespass and a payment for someone from an Irish name to have peace, so to be settled with a case in court, but otherwise the payments are all for release from the neighborhood court, from the court of Visnay, including for a widow, Bazilla. And it 
looks to me like what we have here is someone's really made an effort to after a court session or two that has been held in Kerry to get the payments that they expect. So that what we're seeing is intermittent, but quite strong extraction of what the English exchequer thinks is due to it. And if we go to another document, which is more summary, this one here, um, this is, this bears this out. This is TNA E101 to 3017, which covers the first 13 years of Edward the first up to around 1290. And it's a summary, it's the English Exchequer's attempt to summarise what the king should be getting each year, noting the profits of the county and the major fixed rents and royal services. And it lists a few years of the profits, so it shows us some of the variation in payments. So Kerry and Connacht in this role are paying similar amounts in profits as Cork or Limerick, which is interesting because that's not the impression you get from the rest of the receipt rolls. In, 12, 19, in 1279, Cork had paid £17 in farm, but Connacht paid 18 two years later, and Kerry pays just five. And these amounts do fluctuate. So again, I think we're looking at the effectiveness of individuals in enforcing this political this political ex expectation, rather than saying anything about the actual economic worth of these areas. And then it gets more inter even more interesting in the same role when we get on to what's known as the fixed rents, the Veditas of Caesar, um, where Connacht here is included, but Kerry is not. And the Cucks here are extremely skeptical of their ability to collect, collect what is owned. So if we look at the, the first entries from a Englishman, Richard de Rupella, who's paying for a single cantred. In, again, cantreds, the Gaelic political division, not the English shire, is being used here. And they're also claiming for the events held by the de Boer earls of Ulster, so Walter de Boer is the third entry there. But in between, we have an Irish name, Felt Felimus McConaughey, who ought to pay Solibet Ridere £300 for the farm of three of the cantreds of Connacht. And they note that he has paid nothing on account of the war. So in 1290, the clerks saying this, this major Gaelic Irish lord ought to be paying us for this land, but he is not. And we can start to see the inability of the exchequer to enforce what it thinks it is owed in these in the far west in 1290 after 1315 when the bruce invasion hits from scotland this is going to be absolutely impossible to collect but even at the height of english power we can see tensions here and they're trying to keep alive these claims hoping that one one day they will again be able to claim these and then if we look at the doors of this document so we're still on uh, to 3017, the, you've got memoranda uh, written by the clerks to remind themselves of information. So at the top here, we have a note that um, an O'Brien, uh, the major lord in Thurmond, ought to be paying the exchequer for the moiety of Thurmond, but this has now been granted to Thomas de Clare. And what's interesting, and Thomas de Clare is also not paying. So we've got here, land that the English government has granted out on speculation to Thomas de Clare because the local Gaelic Lord has stopped acknowledging their authority. And in, in either case, they are getting absolutely no money and they know this. And then the second uh, element that's interesting here is that there's a wider problem that the exchequer is aware of in the 1290s at the height of their power that on account of the waste of ireland i'm translating here where individuals are holding land the king loses much and the tenants have full profit so the again this financial ex exactions on the edge of english ireland they know about them, but they can't enforce them. And the final thing I want to think about today um, is something that's sort of been woven through this talk is for the English Lordship of Ireland, legally, according to the documentation, we have things like the Statutes of Kilkenny from the mid 14th century. There's a sharp legal difference 
in theory being enforced between the English and the Irish and Ireland. So you, in theory, the common law is only to be used by the English settlers of Ireland and the Irish are to be set outside of that political and legal sphere. Yeah, that's not the picture we get from the receipt rolls. And it's not the picture that people who've been studying the common law in Ireland in recent years have suggested. And the last thing I want to say before I get, look at these examples particularly is to note that yes, it's extremely difficult to, to identify ethnic identity from names. Um, so the examples I've chosen here are either quite clear, the Irish individuals, or they are very well known individuals. So at the top, this is one that I still find absolutely extraordinary because the more you think about it, what we have here is a payment in Wexford, so from the county just south of Dublin in the 1280s from Alexander McMurra and Dermot, his brother, for a fine to have peace for receiving Arch McMurra. Arch McMurra is the leader of the, the Irish king in the area, so he's the leader of the resistance to the English in and around Dublin and this point. And so what we have here is we have two people from their surnames, kinsmen of Art McMurra, accepting English law to the point where they will pay in a fine and they pay it in in installments. You can see it over the next few years in these roles. They're paying in for harboring Art McMurra and they're accepting the judgment of English law against them for this, which says interesting things about how the English government is inserting itself into Irish politics in this period and the ways in which um, the fluidity between the political alliances of the Gaelic Irish lords and the English settler government works. And it's interesting that it's Wexford because, because the McMurray is the base between Wexford and Dublin at this point. The second example is from um, also from the Dublin area where we have McCodmond Mac uh, Mac and Moore, his mother, is paying in quite a substantial fine, uh, 33 shillings, four, four pence, to have judgment released. So they're interacting with the English law. They've had a judgment brought against them in an English common law court, and they're now asked paying for it to be sort of, um, to be released from it, which is interesting again, in the sense that we see Irish people interacting with English law. And the third example is, um, I put in to remind us that we are dealing with a militarized settler community in Ireland at this period. This is Alistair Cusack in Connacht paying to have the king's hostage, the son and heir of Magnus O'Connor. So what we have here is um, a reminder that for all that we see Irish individuals interacting with the English law and the English administration, we're also dealing with a world of hostages and of military expeditions against the Irish communities, particularly in the west of Ireland. So what can we say to um, draw this together? The first thing I think that we need to remember is that the Exchequer is taking a very expansionist view of English power and English political culture in Ireland, that the whole island of Ireland should be seen as belonging to the English king, and that, of course, people like the O'Brien and Thomond, Thomas de Clare, and all the others should be paying up, and that the ex expectation of English financial uh, fines should be met. And these people probably do, and indeed, in the case of those two, O'Brien and de Clare, definitely did disagree. So, and what we have in Kerry, Connacht and Thomond in particular is a colonial power working on the very edges of territory it can plausibly claim and that it can't really fully claim. So it's sort of like we have a puffed up cat in the English exchequer, you know, trying to make itself look bigger, trying to project authority across the entire island that isn't really there. And that we should be very wary of thinking in the 
late 13th century of the English lordship of Ireland as indeed settled fact that it's already starting to show the signs of the tensions and the um, inability to enforce its authority that will turn into the 14th and 15th century decline ahead of that Tudor uh, reconquest of Ireland starting in the 1540s. So in terms of political culture then, what we're seeing is political culture is something that's moving backwards and forward, that we have times when we do see Irish people coming within the English settler political culture, but then we also see uh, pressures against it. So thank you very much.